Hey, so the thing about springtime and Easter time mix is that there's a lot of things within ideology and the other brands that you can use year round. And sometimes we look at an item based on when it was released and that's all it was. Um, but I'm here to remind you that if you have any of this stuff in your stash, you may want to get to it and you may want to create something. Now the tutorials for these things are on the uh, Easter live that I did in 2022. So Mario will probably throw up a link. So that means it's, it's on the blog. There's going to be close up photos. There's a YouTube video on, on how some of this stuff was done. But first we'll just talk about this tray. I have some stuff in trays. It helps me uh, organize the chaos in my head. And that's just like random stuff within ideology. We have the ideology resin barrels. These are an everyday skew. Toadstools, everyday skew. Launchies for Halloween, but they're everyday. These are great for spring because you can use them as is. You can color them. Uh, we have this one. This is a favorite. This is a skew that we, I always hope will will stick around, but sometimes it, <laughs> it risks getting retired. But these are ideology bouquet. These are paper flowers that you can ink with any kind of inks, sprays, ink pads, uh, even food coloring. They'll take color really easy because they are made out of paper and they have little wire stems so they're flexible. And then we have bubbles uh, that we do for Halloween. So this was something that I made up, this, this little guy, I, I knocked him off just first thing this morning. I had this hot glued, so I'll hold him in place. But just to show you like for the barrels themselves, you can use them and you can create little bubbles just gluing those in with the styrofoam ball. This is the bouquet. This just kind of shows you how easy these are to ink. And I just like to work with uh, Distress Spray Stain. You can also use Mica Stain or you can use your ink pads. A little bit of water and it wicks the color in there. Sometimes you can even go in with a, little, a blending tool like I do. I, I take a blending tool with a little bit of brown to ink the, antique those. These are the toadstools just with moss. There you go, hot glued onto the ruler. Um, and then of course, if you have barrels left over, you can also use them for fall and Christmas. But right now we're kind of in this zone, into the spring zone. Uh, the ruler, I just, it's an easy way to display, but sometimes hot glue is not my friend uh, when I have really clumsy hands. So that's one idea is just look through your stash of embellishments and alter them. This would be one of, of the favorites that I want to call out because you can find these uh, often on Etsy where they're selling them uh, already pre-colored and they're quite expensive. These are so inexpensive because these five bunches are a ton of flowers and the fact that you can uh, bend them because of their wire stem, they're, they're very cool, even for cards, okay? Then we have this one. And of course, these are a classic. These are the bottle brush carrots. So these are taking the woodland trees, which are bottle brush trees. Uh, this is a natural material, a sisal material. Uh, it's like natural rope that absorbs color. And there again, any kind of spray colorant is going to be easy. It could be mica stain, uh, oxide spray, spray stain, dilutions, any kind of sprayable colorant, this will absorb color very quickly. There is a tutorial uh, in the 2022, I take you through spraying it, misting it, kind of rolling it up. But these are things, especially like the woodlands that you would need to buy only at Christmas. They come out at Christmas and you know, maybe you didn't use up your Christmas trees. And by kind of following this tutorial, instead of having it look like a stick out tree, you just wrap it in a paper towel while it's wet to kind of get this carrot shape. And normally I tie uh, raffia around it, but I had an idea yesterday. It was the first thing we did at five o'clock. I'm like, I need to run to the craft store. I got to go. I got to go check something out because I like this, but I can't really find green raffia anymore. And coloring it is, is not fun to do. Um, and I saw some inspiration on Instagram uh, from uh, my friend, the vintage Pelican. <laughs> she has this great shop that, to do all sorts of cool things. And I was like, oh, I love what she was doing with greenery and spools. So I went and found some plastic greenery. Now this is often the stuff that I would just walk by, but this was really interesting because it slides onto these wire stems, right? This kind of greenery where you just, so you don't have to actually cut anything. You just look for the stuff that is attached where you can just kind of pluck it off the wire. If I can do that here, I've already done these cause there we go. You just pull them off the wire and they slide off and they have this hole. So what I did instead is kind of revamp, like just think of it as like bottle brush carrot 2.0. <laughs> I love this look. I love the look of actual plastic greens on this because sliding them off of these pieces allowed me just to slide it on. Cause when you, the bottle brush trees have a wire stem in that little wood base, that wood base twists off. So you could just go in and twist off that base and leave the wire there. And then when you're done with your trees, you just slide this stuff right over that wire. And then when you're done, that's where you put the hot glue. You actually put the hot glue on top, like a little bead of it. 
and that's what keeps these on. But I think it just gave these a whole different fresh vibe. Uh, and I love this. If you were going to put it on a table or something, I just like this greenery. You know, maybe you are into the homespun country and you like the more primitive look, but I thought this really dressed it up. So you could find inexpensive plastic greenery uh, year round, but this is the time that it's pretty much on sale. I mean, this was 50% off uh, just buying it because it's plastic spring stuff. But again, often the things that we walk by, they can be reimagined into something that we do. And so instead of keeping my carrots kind of down after I inked them, I just fluffed them up over the top and I just thought they turned out really great. So something to think about if you have uh, bottle brush trees and you have some plastic greenery, you can reimagine an idea. And that is always important to remember what you know. And just because that's how I've done this, I mean, I've done this for years and years and years. It doesn't mean that when I see something else, I can't connect the dots and go, wow, that's, that's a great idea. Don't they, they, they look way better. That's just a way better idea in my opinion. Okay. So let me move some of this stuff out of the way. I'll hand that off to you. Sure. Thanks. I'm just going to try to save a tray if I can. Cool. Cause I have stuff that I'm going to bring in. All right. Let me balance that. So the next thing that I talked about in 2022, I'm just kind of going, you know, from 2022 so you can find everything and then we'll go into uh, this year as well, which is altering uh, different things that you might find. Maybe you bought them on clearance before. Maybe you have them uh, from previous years that you never got to that make. So reminding you that you can make some foiled eggs. These are actually out of wood. So if you wanted to create larger foil eggs for a display, you can easily create them by purchasing foil candy wrappers. You can find these at the craft store. There's a the demo video on how to alcohol ink this. You just take some alcohol ink and a felt and you rub right over that to tint those a color. And we're, we're gonna get into candy foils as well, but just something that's, that's big enough to wrap these elements, they could be paper mache eggs because you can find those in different sizes uh, or wood ones. And believe it or not, wood ones are often cheaper than paper mache eggs for some reason. Use a little collage medium. You'll see the whole demo and wrap them. But that's a great idea just to remember if you are decorating for Easter, maybe you're doing an Easter uh, party or gathering or dinner. This is also just a great element to put uh, as a tablescape, right, for each person because they don't go bad you don't, and you're not tempted to eat them. Uh, or baubles. We talk about baubles every year. These come out at Christmas time. They're great for mercury glass ornaments. But what about just switching up your color palette and doing pastel baubles? This was kind of the inspiration for the tiny eggs that we launched this year, which is just taking lighter colors. So I didn't use these. These are the bright colors for foils. But any of your light colors of alcohol ink, put these in a little cup, stir them around just like we do the baubles. Again, the demos uh, on the 2022 live. And then you have these pastels, these would be great as fillers for uh, maybe a table or a centerpiece. You can mix up the colors. You can put them uh, as a base for a tea light candle holder, all sorts of different things. And of course you can use them in your makes. So just those three trays were ideas to be like, remember that, remember that, remember that, because you'll want to remember that to, to do it out of sight, out of mind. I am, I am one of you guys as a maker. So I totally get that, that sometimes you just forget what you've done. Okay. Okay, so next, let's get into this year. Let's get into what we launched this year. And this was actually a live that we did back in January, which was a little weird. I did an Easter live, kind of tried to mix it with Valentine's Day. Um, the, I had some issues with the video for whatever reason I saw uh, on Facebook that there were issues with that video that I did. So uh, hopefully the video is fixed. I had to edit it down to get it to re-upload, but now it just has the Easter content, which is fine. And what's great about this release was this was the first time for Ideology that we did a spring seasonal release. And it was only these two SKUs, the Salvage Rabbits and the Tiny Eggs. When I say seasonal, that means this was a one and done, meaning they, they came out in January. They, they're available at retailers uh, worldwide. They did sell out from Advantis, who's a manufacturer, uh, in January. But I've seen that there's still retailers that have remaining stock of these. But just know that once they're gone, they're gone for the season. I'm hoping they come back next year. I don't see why they wouldn't because they did so well. Um, but you know, that, that's not up to me. But what's great about these is I shared a bunch of different ideas of how you can alter these. And again, I'm not gonna demo this. I have other things to demo in this slide, but I wanted to remind you of some ideas that we can do with, first up, 
the salvage rabbit. So this one, there's a demo on using foundry wax. So to create a faux foil wrap. Initially, my idea was, oh, I'll just take that candy foil and try to wrap it. That did not work. It was too detailed to get the foil to stick and I didn't have that kind of patience. And I love using foundry wax. Distress foundry wax is a, a fluid wax that when you heat it, it actually leafs. So you get this beautiful mirrored finish. You could do other colors. Foundry wax comes in four colors, but I did the silver. And then once you apply the, the heat to it, because this guy is heat stable and he's got that shine, went over the little distressed crayon to kind of just tarnish him up and he's just great. And that was, of course, the inspiration for this little, this little make. So there's that resin barrel that I talked about at the beginning. There's that little rabbit in there and just use some cellophane. You can use some leftover packaging. You can use anything uh, to wrap that little basket. And then I just did some, some tool or you can do ribbon and create a great basket. Simple, right? Simple to do. But you can also do other things. You can make a chocolate one. This one is just using distressed paint in walnut stain. You do want to, I use walnut stain because I like this color chocolate, but you can use any brown paint that you want. If you are going to paint this and you want it to be smooth, you're going to want to wait for the paint to dry between layers. I gave this, I gave this guy two layers of paint, but he, he looks perfect. I think he looks like a nice chocolate. Tammy B did a great tutorial. She even uh, painted some eyes on there. So like the whole chocolate bunny and, and her and I agree that like eating off the eyes was the first thing I did as a kid. Sounds gross, but that's what you do. And then this one, just kind of a faux wood. What I love about this, and again, they all start out the same. This one, instead of using walnut, whoa, walnut stain paint. I wanted to put that in there. Um, I use ground espresso. Ground espresso is a little bit darker. This you paint it on, but instead of letting it dry 100%, you just kind of wipe it off a little bit, or you can pounce it off with a sponge. Uh, it, it, it's a little tricky, but once you get the hang of it, of how much paint you want to remove, then you just let it dry and it has that perfect age look. You can take a dry brush through it. Uh, you can scratch through it. You can do all sorts of things, but I love what distress paint and foundry wax does uh, to, to just these rabbits. Really simple to do. Then we did a whole demo on the tiny eggs. Great way to decorate these little pieces. This would be the first one. This is using alcohol ink. And again, the demo is uh, this year. So Mario can throw up a link for the 2023 uh, Easter. I think it's called Salvage Rabbit and Tiny Eggs. That's what I renamed the live. So it's easier to find on YouTube. But you can see that alcohol ink in a little plastic bag that makes the most wonderful, colorful eggs. Now, I happen to like these eggs that have dark and light areas. And that's from the bag itself where you get the darker drips and the lighter areas. The trick to these, in my opinion, when you're doing it, is you want to make sure that when you put the alcohol ink in the bag and you smush it around with the egg, you dump them out while they're wet on something like wax paper or parchment paper or deli wrap. You don't use a paper towel because the paper towel will absorb the ink and create a white spot. But there's tricks to that as well. You can give them a double dose of ink if you want them a little bit more solid. Then we have these. Look at these little foil wrapped eggs. If you think those big ones were cool, which they were, it's great to have these big eggs. Look at these tiny ones. Now, this was done exactly the same way, alcohol inking uh, those little candy foils because I had them, they were easy to do. But of course, it's Easter time. So Easter time means that you can go out to the, to the store. Uh, I got these at the dollar store. Now, lucky for me, I don't eat milk chocolate. I only like dark chocolate. So there was zero temptation. But if you like any kind of chocolate, this is a bonus. But you can look for the foil eggs that that don't have any printing. You know, a lot of them have brand names on there. Some of them don't. These, in this case, they don't. And you just unwrap them and you utilize the foils. They're, they're the same thing. So these are the foils that were unwrapped from these eggs. Again, from the dollar store, you get just great colors. And they're very similar to your alcohol inked foils. I mean, the only difference is that they have that, that t wrinkly texture, which I happen to already love. But you can do exactly the same thing where, again, the tutorial will show you about cutting this, doing a little bit of collage medium because the collage medium will allow it to grab onto that little plastic egg, roll it around with your fingers to flatten it out. And then you've got the most adorable little foil eggs. Simple. And that's, that's what I glued in this basket. I just like the idea of having those shiny little foil eggs with the reflective foundry wax rabbit. So again, that idea. So if you don't want to be bothered with alcohol ink and foils, Go pick yourself up some, some snacks if you haven't already. Unwrap them and save them. Or you can do, I mean, throughout the year, you can do a little Hershey Kiss. That'll give you silver ones. So it's a great way to, 
to repurpose and when you're looking around you're like okay i don't even care to eat this but that's a good deal for all that tinted foil for a that buck a great deal. <laughs> the way i see it that was easy okay then we did some sugary ones and again this was a great demo i love these little sugary eggs what's nice about this is that there's so many different ways to uh, achieve a very similar result i love working with glitter believe it or not rock candy glitter because it's like sugar so that shouldn't surprise you if it has anything to do with sugar or sweets it's got my name on it so distress rock candy this is a clear glitter that's what i love about that is it's not iridescent you can see it's got like that sugary kind of texture to it and what's really nice about that is we can create a bazillion colors of that glitter so these are all tinted distress glitters tinted rock candy and what was what was weird is i i often have trouble finding where i posted something or even did a video i even messaged zoe like it was her late last night and i'm like where is this tutorial for blah 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 and she's like i don't know let me find it so sometimes i even forget where i share things and i couldn't find when was the last time i talked about how to tint glitter so i'm just going to do it real quick because it is really quick but all you need to color rock candy and you can make it in so many different colors. I mean, everything from pinks to reds. I mean, you, you've got your whole season of glitter, but instead of this being like a Mylar glitter, and that's what I think people don't understand, when you buy colored glitter at the craft store, it's, it's a metallic glitter, it's Mylar, like a Mylar balloon. And so it's opaque. When you put it on, it's silvery, it's opaque. What's great about this is you are creating a translucent glitter. So that's what gives it more of that sugary look. So on these eggs, there's no inking or anything. This is just the tinted glitter on the eggs. And I use glossy accents for this one. Sometimes I use collage medium, like I talked about using collage medium on the foil. Uh, glossy accents for this one is, is my jam because it's shiny, which means if I miss a spot, I still get a little bit of reflection. It's also easier to, to stick glitter down because it's very tacky stuff. There's a finesse to it, but man, don't those look delicious? And look how they sparkle. That's the beauty of rock candy. So to create a custom color of glitter, these are in the Distress storage jars. Ranger sells these empty storage jars. I love them because they're clear and I love the aluminum lid. This is the Distress storage tin. It used to be called the crayon uh, storage tin, but that's where you can fit the jars. You can fit them laying down sideways or you can fit them standing up if you want to label the top because many people use them for everything from embellishments to glitter. But here's how easy it is to color rock candy. You're going to need a paper towel for this one. So although I said you could use deli paper if that's what you were using before, but in this case, we actually want the moisture to evaporate quick. You want some type of disposable cup. It doesn't have to be uh, anything with measurements. It could be a paper cup. It could be anything that you want. You're going to take some rock candy and you're just going to pour some in, you know, however much you want to tint, because once you color it, you color it. Then you're going to take alcohol ink. You'll need alcohol ink for this. You can't use a reinker. You can't use a food coloring or anything because it will never dry on this. Uh, glitter is still a plastic and alcohol ink works on plastic. So it's going to be the, the best colorant. You're also going to need some type of stick, something that we can stir this with. It could be a, a metal spoon, whatever you want. And it's really easy. So we're going to open the alcohol ink, whatever color you want. There is no measurement, so you're just going to squeeze some ink in there like that. You'll take the stick and you're just going to start stirring it up. And when you start stirring it, you're going to think you did something wrong because it looks really clumpy. But you just keep stirring, keep stirring, keep stirring, and you're mixing this up. And you're going to see that it starts to almost become like wet sand. And you can smash it if you see like a little ball of color. But if you just keep stirring it around, it's super, super simple. But it does take on this weird consistency like wet sand because right now there is moisture from the ink in there now if you like this color you're done if you want it more intense you can add more ink but here's what you need to be mindful of when you work with alcohol ink when you color the glitter it's only going to color the glitter up to the color of the label meaning if you wanted something dark blue you you can't create this color with this ink just even if you add more ink it's only going to be up to the intensity of this label color. So this is, I would say, is a little bit lighter than this label, so that I probably used less last time. But this one, I think I used enough because oh, it's a pretty good match. So you do have creative control as to uh, how you want to add the color. So once it's mixed up and you're happy with it being mixed, you could add more ink if you needed to. 
We're just going to take this and we're going to dump this out onto a paper towel. Now, why do you do that instead of just leaving it in the cup? Well, because I want this to dry quicker and it's also easier just to kind of spread this out and all of these little chunky bits you'll see quickly go away. So as the air is hitting this right now, you can see it even drying on the paper towel. Now, do you have to mix this back and forth? No, you can let it sit on the paper towel. But my point is, is that as soon as air hits this glitter, it goes back to its powdery consistency. It no longer will have this clumpy thing. That takes about, uh, I would say maybe five to 10 minutes, depending on where you live. You don't need to heat it. You certainly don't want to put a fan on it because it will blow everywhere. But once it dries, it does go to a perfect consistency of dry glitter. See, it has, there's no clumps to it because the solvent in alcohol ink evaporates. That's where that moisture is coming from, a solvent, and we want that to dissipate and then you have permanently colored dry glitter. So that's how easy it is to pretty much sugar everything. So if you wanted to have like, you know, sugared little elements for Valentine's Day, you could have done, you know, maybe you found some little heart. And the, the best part about this is it doesn't matter what the surface is. Maybe you found little heart wood shapes or beads or anything, little glossy accents, a little glitter, you had sugary hearts or you have sugary things for uh, Easter, Christmas, Halloween, whatever. And then I just take this and put it in the cup. Really that easy. So simple, right? When you, when you understand why we're using alcohol ink and most people, they think, oh, I'm just going to use a reinker and they try to use a stamp pad reinker and they're like, my glitter is never drying. What am I doing wrong? It's that ink. That's, that's the key factor of that. I'm just going to hand that over to Mario. So, cause we know what happens when I have a sheet of glitter everywhere. So that would be the sugar eggs. And then lastly, we did some speckled eggs and this is just using distress paint again, but I use speckled egg. That's the color. How fitting. It's that perfect little blue. So I use speckled egg distress paint. <laughs> don't ask me what color it is. <laughs> that was so funny. Uh, Mario's like, I don't know. I'm like, okay, guess. So speckled egg. And for painting these, I just take it and put some paint on my fingers, put the egg, roll it around and drop it onto a piece of parchment paper. So I like the imperfection of the paint. I don't actually go in with a paintbrush, just using your fingers. Then once that paint dries, you can use a heat tool uh, or just let it dry for a few minutes. I went in with a distressed splatter brush. You can also use whatever you use to splatter paint. Some people use the end of a paintbrush and a, an acrylic block. Some people use a toothbrush, anything to splatter paint. So I wanted little dots. You can do them black. You can do them ground espresso. You can do any color you want, but then it creates these little eggs. And that's important because even after a season, if you didn't get into making for Easter, or maybe you don't make for Easter, but you want to make for spring, making these eggs really charming because you can take an idea and you can make an easy spring make. So this is an ideology display dome. So this comes with a cork base. I just take it off the cork base because sometimes I want to use the cork base and sometimes I don't. Here I went and got a wood slice. You can find these, well, if you have bigger trees, you can find them in your yard. Uh, if you have somebody with a, a chainsaw to cut them up, but you can find these at the craft store. So I wanted something that was a larger diameter than this so it could sit on it. But I've used so many things as bases from jelly jars, all sorts of things. But then I did a little spring make using uh, little, those little eggs little speckled eggs in there, a nest, a little bit of moss, and a twig that we just found in our yard 10 minutes before the live started. Two minutes. Well, you know, <laughs> two minutes. I say 10, he says two, and he's probably right. Um, because I was like, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if I could find a stick? Because Stacy really turned a lot of people on to just using a stick. Very cool. So let me tell, let me tell you a little, little trick about a nest, okay? Now, I've been known for making nests in my day. Known for my nest back in the day. There was a time that I was teaching... Uh, at a store and we were supposed to make something with a nest that I had already bought at the craft store, you know, like pre-purchase nests because you can buy them. And for whatever reason, they didn't get packed. And so part of the class and Jen Cherkis was in that class. Um, oh my gosh. The class had no idea that they weren't there. And I was like, hey, so part of this class, we're going to learn how to make a nest. Mario's like, you know how to make a nest? Nope. So we went out, had the whole class gather a bunch of twigs and, and grass. We went in. We all use like a, a portion cup as a base and we made nests and they actually turned out cool, but they're not easy to do. So I like to buy nests at the craft store. You can find these really every place from the dollar store or any other place. But around Easter time, you can find them way cheaper than the rest of the year. For whatever reason, if you go to buy a nest in the middle of the year, you have to go to the floral section and they're 
stupid money, but it's springtime. Like I think this whole bag was maybe like a, a buck and a half for, for four of them. Okay. But here's the, here's the trick to, to create this. If you look at the nest and you can usually see this in the package, you want to see like how it's made. You see that wire around here? That's really all that's holding this nest together, believe it or not. But they wire it together while the, while this stuff is still wet. And then as it dries, it creates this perfect shape. Obviously I didn't want something that big or that perfect. I wanted something a little bit more organic. So here's the trick to that. All you need to do is you can get a pair of wire cutters. If you have the snips, you can use your snips and you're just going to go in and you're going to cut the end of the wire and you'll unwrap this. So it's often like stitched through. See, they just kind of sew it through. So once you cut one end, you can kind of just follow the wire and you could save the wire. It's actually pretty cool. Rusty wire it has a great little finish. So you could save this for another make, correct? Take this, take this, and we're going to remove that wire. Really important because that, that is what's kind of holding uh, the foundation together. It doesn't pop open because it's dry like that, but now we have the ability to alter it. So again, these wire pieces, look at that. Great for, yeah, some cool ideology makes, wrap around some bottles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for this, all I did was decided, okay, I want it to be about this big at the bottom. And I just start ripping the stuff off. This stuff is really easy to just take your fingers. You want to hold the base because that's what we want to keep together. And you just start ripping it off. Pretty simple. If you, if you get to an area like this, that's just too hard. You can go in with the scissor and you can just chop that off. But once you get it to the size that you want like that, that's a pretty good size. It's still going to keep its shape, but now you have, in my opinion, a way more organic nest. How easy is that? That's so simple. It's really simple. And then I just glued in the eggs, little hot glue. Yeah, you have a, a bit of a mess, but you could save this for something else. Maybe this is kind of more like a garland, like a grapevine garland. That could be cool. But these I picked up, I think we picked these up at Hobby Lobby. They were, and again, they were like four pack for maybe two bucks because they were on sale. But it really creates such a nice thing. But look everywhere. I've seen nests, honestly, at the dollar store, Walmart, everywhere. But springtime is the time to buy them because they're cheaper for some reason. And that doesn't seem uh, like that would make sense. All of this was just hot glued, hot glued a little bit of moss, hot glued the nest, hot glued the stick. And I used the moss to kind of cover the glue ooze. So that's just the easiest. Could you glue this on? Yes. If you were going to glue on the glass, I would use collage medium, but I like the fact that, you know, I can just fit that right over the top. Nice little close. You could tie a ribbon around it if you wanted to, but it's really simple and a great gift or just a great decor piece using some elements. That was quick. I'll just be happy when we stop yes. talking about nests. Yeah. It still gets me going. Does it? Yeah. Oh. Terrible. Oh, no, that was it was actually fun that see that's what creates the stories. That's the best part. That, that's what creates the stories. The yeah, it didn't but it was it was I think the best the best part of that. All right. So let me just clean this up real quick. Bye, Take my little surfer, but that's a it's a good tip, right? Because sometimes you just can't find the right size. And I think understanding that you can just snip that wire and cut it apart. Now some of them like if they're kind of the yellowy ones. I don't really like that because they're they're not as as organic. So I always look for the ones that just look like they're made out of twigs, but I think that's a, a great tip, a great hack, if you will. Okay. So for me, inspiration is everywhere. When I look at stuff, I'm often inspired by so many different things, different makers, different ideas. And Tammy B definitely inspired me uh, for spring. She did a great post, a great tutorial, creating these cool statues. Uh, using Lost Shadow and she used grit paste and it kind of, in, it reminded me of Haunted Mansion. I'm like, oh, that's such a great idea. She used vignette finials. She even used some urns. So this is just an idea to remind you of, hey, you can take even seasonal stuff or elements. This happens to be the Halloween urns. Uh, sadly, these are not coming back this year. So if you, if you didn't stock up, you're out of luck because they're, they are gone now, but these are little uh, resin urns. But again, you can use a Finials, you have to check out Tammy's YouTube. She did a great tutorial on how to create it. But I went in and added the little salvage rabbit. So I, because he's about as big as the top of the urn, I did the little trick with the one inch styrofoam ball. I've talked about that in the, uh, the live that we did this year as well. Little styrofoam ball, shoved it in here, glued him on. Uh, I used hot glue for most everything, a little collage medium at the very end. But once he was done, 
I went in with grit paste crypt. Uh, Tammy used just, I think, translucent grit paste, but I, I wanted some with like the little, I like the little black flecks in there. Made it really kind of grungy, very haunted mansion for me. Added a little grit paste, let that dry. Added some paint. I used pumice stone, she used lost shadow because I wanted to do it different. And I think that's important to know that you can use different elements that you have. Once that paint was dry, just went in uh, with some grungy colors of Distress Crayon. But again, she has a great tutorial, but this, what a fun make to either, especially if you're making for Halloween, you can do some creep or just create a little secret garden. Perfect for spring. This would also look good under a dome. You could add it to other elements, but that it's cool to see that, hey, you can take just that plain rabbit, glue it onto that thing and transform it into something totally different just with stuff that you have. It, like it looks like it's peel, the stuff is peeling off. That's the magic of grit paste. That's, That's awesome. it, grit paste crib. This only comes out at Halloween. Yeah. I feel it. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's cool, huh? That is so neat. Feels like stone. I don't even feel like plastic. I know, it's just it's grungy goodness. So, and see, I love that. I put it over like his eye, like his eye was kind of chipping off. Yeah, anyway, off. fun, fun things to do with the rabbit. And then, while we were at the craft store last night, I walked by, <laughs> this these oh this bag of this bag of these little topiary things and immediately i was transformed uh, transported not transformed transported <laughs> to small world to disneyland if you've ever been to disneyland you see small world they have these great topiaries outside of all these animals and i'm like oh my gosh mario i love these look how great they are wouldn't it be cool to make a little one and we walked around the entire store looking for this stuff, this fuzzy stuff, because it really isn't flocking. It's not like cottony stuff. It's kind of fuzzy. It's yeah, fuzzy, fuzzy stuff. And it has all these little green ones. I'm like, oh, I really want to make one so bad. And so Mario said, oh, just get those. I'll just shave them. And I'll <laughs> just shave them. That's exactly what he said. So, yeah. So I said, you think you can do that? He goes, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure I can. Uh, he's grabbing the razor so he can show you. It's so easy. there you go. So you can bring here. This is here. You can keep the cord. Thanks. Okay. This is what he used. Yep, a clipper. He just took a clipper and it. shaved the rabbits. So this one is how they come, which you don't think there's much on there to shave. That's why I'm like, is that, a, is that idea going to work? But then as he goes in shaving it down, because these are just made out of like styrofoam, yeah, he totally shaved all that cool green fuzz off to where I got a little bag of it and it doesn't seem like anything it, but it's a bunch of little green fibers that's and i only shaved two i left you one so you had you can see the difference and i made one with what's in this bag so there's a lot of stuff in there so again these little rabbits maybe they were a buck and a half for three of them because they're on sale i i don't like them if you have them and using them i'm sure you enjoy them and that's great i just wanted something a little smaller so what i did for this guy was I started with my rabbit, but because anytime I cover something with something, I always like to paint it. So even before I did like the paste, I like to do a base coat of paint. So in this case, I did a base coat of uh, green. I use forest moss because it's a darker green. This way, if I missed an area of the moss, it's gonna be okay to do that, all right? Because if you kept it white, you would totally see where you, where you missed a spot. And I'm just gonna take off this dome so you can really see, look at him. Isn't he great? He's so fun. He's got a little glue string on it. Look at that. So, it's so fun. He's so cool. So this guy is actually in a small display dome. So we have display domes in different sizes. The, the one I showed you with the nest, that was the regulation size. That one's like one in a package. The small ones, they're two in a package. And I think they're perfect for the bunny or anytime you're doing something small or a little centerpiece. It's really simple to do. So painted that, let it dry, collage medium. Then I, you want to do one side at a time. I learned that. So you're going to paint on a layer of collage medium because that's going to dry matte. Very important to remember uh, your glue choices matter. If you, if you use a glossy glue, then wherever you missed will be shiny. I wanted it to be matte. So after the paint dried, I painted one side with collage medium. It wasn't attached to the cork, by the way. It was attached to the popsicle stick. Uh, then I went in with this stuff took it and literally just pressed it on, put it on really thick and pressed it on there, flipped it over, collage medium, pressed it on there, and I let it dry for about, I'll say 30 minutes to an hour, just so the collage medium had time to totally dry. And then I just went in with a, 
a soft, dry brush and just brushed off any of the excess and boom, there you have it. And if you missed a spot, you could easily go back and add it. But I have plenty, plenty more for something else. I looked online just to buy this fuzz. We walked all over the store to buy this fuzz. And even if you find this flocking powder, I couldn't find it in all these different greens. So you can find that green moss in a package at the miniature section of Hobby Lobby. Ooh, Tammy B shared that. Oh, see, Tammy B just shared a great idea. Thanks, Tammy B. I'm going there to look. She said that in the miniature section, see, that's an area I've not gone. You can find this to create turf or grass for model trains. Model trains. I'm on it. Although the shaving is good. Also, I, we have to do a little cost comparison, Mario. We'll be checking that out to be like, do we want to shave bunnies or do we want to buy the powder? But it's really fun to create this look because again, very Disney. And then I took a little, little string and one of the new word tags, these tiny little tags, and I tied it around. This one says happy because I thought that was really great for Easter. These just came out in ideology in March. Add a little distressed crayon and there you go. Cute. Cute and simple. And you can leave it like that. This is just a little butter pat. You can even put it in there. You can add maybe some candy or jelly beans. And that could be also a great, great little setting for an Easter, Easter meal, Easter brunch. Cute. It's a lot of fun. Thanks for that tip, Tammy B. I got to check that out too. Although the shaving idea is pretty, that's what you do, right? That, that's the whole idea for the maker. It's like, I, like I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. I know, but you probably get a good bulk of it. But I do love the mix. I love that it's got like little flecks of brown and that's good. All right. So that was some other ideas for the rabbits. So far, so good. Right, guys? It's really good. Okay. That bunny came out so good. It was fun. It was great, great fun. Okay. I'm going to move some stuff. Can I hand you that tray? Absolutely. Thank you very much. I might need a back, but for right now, I think I'll take these makes just so I have them. Thanks, Mario. You're welcome. I'm like handing off yeah, stuff welcome. to Mario and just trying to make room because sometimes it's, it's like coin dozer around here. Okay, next we're gonna talk about stuff. Stuff that you should find in your creative space and we'll talk about it because I think, again, as makers, out of sight, out of mind. And I don't say that like, I can't believe you don't know that. It's really just the fact that very often we think we have things figured out because we bought stuff or, and then it just hasn't connected of like, oh my gosh, I need to use that. So when you go through your dyes, there's been many different dyes that I've done through the years, especially this time of year, uh, Easter time, spring with Sizzix. So we have this year, this, the Stitch Bunny, uh, Bunny Games last year, didn't come back this year, sadly, but this is a great one, very cute. I uh, love this guy, <laughs> colorize, he's so fun. Remember this one? Do love that oliver was hilarious but this one this little carrot bunny so it's got these little bunnies with these cutouts totally not my style but also very cute i needed to put it in the line uh, a larger carrot so you can uh, do a little line dance with them these these little hippity hops great retro silhouettes we did a couple of bigs but other things besides rabbits that you may want to look into your stash anything wood you know i like a good wood grain wood grain stone any organic element these make great foundations for your cards. So if you're looking to do stuff, maybe you have a bunny and you're like, what do I put it with? You could put it on a, a wood background. You can put it on this new wood slice. We did this one uh, for Valentine's Day, but you can put that little bunny in. You can do Easter or not even use the font because that's separate. If you're not doing anything carved, you can create a background. There's just so many elements that you can incorporate bunnies and flowers with wood and stone. It just kind of brings in that whole, well, that whole organic thing, that outdoors look. And sometimes we don't look at our folders or our backgrounds of textures when it comes to spring because we're only looking at like chicks and bunnies. And that's really important to remember. Flowers, depending on the flowers, I've done so many different styles of flowers. Maybe your style is more modern. Maybe you like something more artsy or abstract. Maybe you want something... Uh, more beautiful, like colorized. Maybe you want something more silhouette for mixed media. I love this whole wildflower border that you could uh, run a continuous border of. Maybe you just do some large cutouts. Maybe you want to do butterflies because you're, you're more into making for springtime. Okay, or the birds, the silhouettes. Those were out last year. Or feathers. These are all different designs that you may or may not have in your stash that you can dive into besides just the bunny and if you depending on how you store them i store them out in a binder but even if you don't have a binder i say this every season grab something whether that's a container a box a binder and put the ones that you're going to want to use 
in there. So even if you don't get to it, like that one's so funny, uh, the paper cut checks, even if you don't get to it, it, you might be reminded of like, oh, I wanna do, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. Because what you can do with dies is actually so inspiring. I think there's so many different ideas out there. In fact, Zoe, Zoe Hillman did a great make. I shared it in my story, you have to check it out, where she used the Taylor die and then she used the bunnies, uh, the bunny ears from the bunny stitch to put those out of the hat. There was uh, a lady on Instagram who used bunny ears on uh, an ideology uh, portrait, which I thought was great. I think it, I think Rika is her name, but I don't, I don't know her Instagram off the top of my head. Paula might, but she did just a great make where she took a, a paper doll, the portrait, and then she, she cut out her own bunny ears. But even if you don't want to cut out your own, you may look at your dies just for the ears at that point. Cause I thought that was a great idea where depending on what you're doing, you can just say, okay, I just want those ears. That's going to be perfect and paint them or color them or put them with something else uh, by creating a little different with your dies. That's important. Another cool idea that I love when it, it comes to dies is just like how we, how we kind of put things together. So let me just share some, a, a couple of, just a couple of ideas, not necessarily a remix. We're not going to go full remix, but I am just going to share some ideas uh, with you of how you can look at your dies a little differently. Okay. So let's take, because this is how my creative brain works and it is what it is. You just have to kind of deal. So when you look at these, you would think like, okay, that's, that's interesting. I see three totally different ideas, totally different uses for these dies. But I see these as like, I need to put these together. And you wouldn't think that they would go together. And maybe when you see them together, you're like, that's absolutely horrible, but that's okay. Uh, I think it's fun to just be creative and playful with, with what you have. And when I talked about the remix last year, it was just about taking dies that you have and reimagining them in different ways. So this is the original art for this guy. Really, this is bird and egg. I think that's what I actually named this die. So those are the moments when you have no creative ideas and you're like, what do you want to call it? I think we called it bird and egg, but it was just a great die. And it was sitting there because I like to keep some of the packaging stuff. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And then I saw these components. And again, I was inspired by Zoe where she used the Taylor die and she added the bunny ears. And I'm like, oh, that's really fun. So I, I took all of those things off of the cardstock because normally I have it on the cardstock uh, for packaging, use my little tag for the scissor. And I thought, let's kind of do like a, a paper doll dress up thing to see if it works. And I just started to have a little fun with it. So imagine this guy, there's our, our little suit. When you place it down on this bird, it just kind of works. And even though he's got these little areas that that stick over the top. I'm not bothered. I'll, I have no problem trimming it. I would normally be building this off of the cardstock, but I'm just going to do this in real time because I don't care. I'm just going to trim that like that. And I'm just following kind of the body of the bird. But I love the fact that that little jaggedy thing kind of fits with his style. I thought, well, that's fun. And then maybe we want to give him a tie. Maybe we want to give him like a necktie. He could have a necktie. That could be fun. Now the ties, they all have the loops around the back of it. So whether you're doing, you know, the bow ties or the necktie, if you don't want that, well, we just trim that off. So I would just go in, trim that off. And now I have the necktie. So let's bring that up. Look at that, he means business. That's hilarious. Okay, I love that. Uh, maybe we'll change it to a bow tie in a minute. And then we've got different hat options. We've got a straw hat, we've got a top hat, we've got a bowler hat, but this just, fun because I like the idea that just by kind of angling the hat, we've totally transformed this guy into something fun and unique. And again, you may hate this. You may say, well, that's just odd. And it is, and odd is fun in my world. But then I was like, oh, he, he looks kind of dapper. So when I saw that, I'm like, ooh, he needs a monocle. So I just cut this, this piece out, cut off that little stick just so there's a ring, just cut it out of silver cardstock. And I even left that little end and I thought it fit around his eye pretty well. So we'll hold that up. There you go. That's what he needs. He's so dapper, super fun, where you're working with just things, things that you wouldn't normally think go together. That's the fun of making. And that's important to remember as a maker, because sometimes, you know, depending on what's coming out or what's new and you don't have it all and you think, oh, I don't have this, I'm not inspired to make. Yes, you need to go in and, and dip into your stash and say, okay, I'm gonna make this work. I'm gonna see what I can create. So I think he's hilarious. Let's, let's put on 
let's even give him some formal attire. Let's do a little, look at this. He's got a little tux because the other one in Taylor, little tux. And I love how it just kind of goes right around that neck. To me, it was, it was just meant to be. Couldn't say I designed it this way. It's just meant to be. But, you know, working with Lisa, often there's things that just serendipitously happen when we're doing dyes. So, again, I would have cut this not on the cardstock. I would have done it in the air so it could totally match. But this is, look, eyeballing, it's going to work. There we go. He's got his little tux. Let's get his monocle off for now. Maybe he needs a little top hat this time. Ooh, he's fancy. Yeah, I still think he needs, I still think he needs that little monocle because that, that makes him, I think, even more sophisticated. That's pretty fun. And I think for this, he needs, he needs that nice red bow tie. So there again, I'm going to get rid of that that ring around it and you could take off a layer actually if you take off the top layers you'll be fine but uh, I'm, I prefer the dimension of that so that's why I'll just cut that off there we go and let's just put that oh my gosh, that I think so awesome. I think I'm just gonna put that there so there's that guy he's pretty cool I think you know you look kind of reminds me of the I know he's not a penguin but he kind of reminds me of the penguin from Batman but really fun to just dress up something that maybe you wouldn't think to do. You could still, you could dress up an egg, you know, you could put the egg with uh, the collar and all of that. And imagine that. If this was regulation size, if you didn't trim it, I think even having an egg head like Humpty Dumpty, that'd be so fun to do that, put a hat on him. It just helps you kind of enjoy the creative play of that. I think that's fun. It totally could be a wedding invitation. I agree. It's He's really fun. And yes, I see people say he needs an Easter suit, bright blues and greens. Absolutely. You can totally change the colors. It's just the idea to remind you to look at what you have and just reimagine it. Sometimes you'll be surprised how even in this case, something new like this one. I love this die because I love the dimension that it creates for the clothing that a lot of times those pieces will work with things that you least expect uh, to work with. But I think yeah, that's still that's really so a favorite. Cool. So much fun. Okay. So that's just kind of reminding you to go into your stash, pull out some dyes and just look at the components and go, okay, it is kind of like color forms and just saying, gosh, this is fun. It's fun to just kind of play around with. So another idea that I wanted to, to throw your way is this one. So this one came out at, at Christmas time and I, I told people, I'm not going to say I warned because I didn't warn. I just reminded you creatively reminded you that when you look at a package sometimes, depending on when a die or a stamp for that matter is released, often it has a very strong seasonality because that is when it's released. And in this case, this whole layered plaid, it had a, a nice festive vibe. Now this could easily be Valentine's, this could be so many different things. But remember, when you have a background die, changing the color completely changes, in my opinion, the entire appearance of a die. All right, so you could start with either a craft background or a white background, depending on what, what type of card maker you are. Cut out of all different pastel colors. You can do two tones. So remember on these, you can flip these around different ways. Each time you're gonna get a, a whole different type of plaid. But when you place this down, let me stack this up because this die comes with three dies. It comes with a die to cut a card front and then two dies because these will fit on that panel and give you that little edge. But take a look at that so simple so spring and you can do uh, tone on tone if you want or you can just completely mix it up and you could say okay i want to do purple on pink because the possibilities are endless so you just think of this die and how you want to create it and you say okay i like this because i see that wide uh, pink stripe but if i flip it over this way the way these line up let me stack them up properly then see how it kind of breaks up that solid line and now it gives you a narrow line so you do get a different visual by flipping around those layers. But I love the different color combos. And even on craft, if you want something a little bit more vintage, you can still mix those colors on craft. I think I'll probably, I think I want to do this blue on this mint, on this craft. Yeah, I like those colors together. The browns, simple, right? Something totally different when it comes to working with different pieces and different components. And I think the best way to start is this way. Don't try to figure it out in your head, unless you're only making one thing. If you're only making one thing, okay, then you need to figure it out. But a lot of times you can spend so much time uh, choosing cardstock. And some people choose cardstock like you're, you're choosing the color to paint your house. It's not that big of a life altering decision. So I think getting out some cardstock and just cutting, 
then you have options because then you can mix and match. These could be backgrounds. This could be something that maybe you apply to another shape and cut it out. So maybe you do this, maybe you glue it onto a piece of cardstock and maybe you have a big egg shaped die and then you cut that again and now you have a plaid egg. There's so many different things when it comes to utilizing your dies, but at face value, you look at that and you're like, mm, okay, that's, that's either gonna be like Christmas or you know, maybe it's gonna be Valentine's Day, but certainly you don't think of it as Easter and it works. And you can use these plaids separately as well. You don't have to layer them together. So why are these plaids, but sometimes they're tartan? They are tartan. They're always tartan, Mario. But you know, <laughs> no, I don't difference? know. I, I think so. Tartan is, I think, a certain style of plaid, if I believe it. I think Google would answer that a little bit better, but I think it's a certain type of oh. plaid, uh, I think. But I'm, I'm sure there's plaid experts in the group, fancy, I'm sure. Fancy um, word for... It is very tartan. Look at that. Look at that dimension. But tartan. sometimes, tartan, and we do love a good tartan. Sometimes I look at these and I, I see something other than even the plaid. So when I was working on this, I looked at this and this, this brought something to mind where I was like, you know what, I, I like that, but it reminds me of like a springtime lattice. So I'm like, I wonder what would happen if I took this die and paired it with this die, mini brush stroke, but instead of using all these colors of cardstock, I just use wood grain. And I thought it made a really cool trellis to put flowers on. Now you may not like that and that's okay, you do you, but I thought, that's a very cool thing to take the wider component, so not the, the skinny one, because I didn't think I would get enough wood grain. Do a background. This is Distress Wood Grain cardstock. Maybe you've done a bunch of wood grain backgrounds in the past. I use tiny little foam squares. Simon Says Stamp offers those really tiny little, uh, I think they're quarter inch foam squares. That's what's dimension uh, between this and that craft base because I think that little bit of dimension. And then I just use the flowers I did for packaging. You could do matchy matchy, I get it. You probably wouldn't have this kind of crazy look, but if you wanted to just kind of create a little trellis, maybe you're gonna do roses and then put a sentiment there. That's just an idea of using a plaid die with some flowers. Maybe it's not even this die. It's not about the dies themselves per se, it's about the idea. So you could customize this however you want, but did you ever think of just using one layer of plaid, doing it out of wood and creating a garden lattice? Maybe you did, I did. but I love that <laughs> you did. Um, but I love that idea. And I think raising it off of the surface also gives it that dimensional aesthetic. Okay. That to me is just like, it's, it's just a cool, clever way to reimagine. And that's what I was saying about this live ideas. It's about giving you ideas to say, look at what you have, right? This is about making. This is really about making, 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 putting some things together. Even if you make one thing for the spring season, make something, okay? So the other thing that we can imagine our dyes to be are really props for other things. And I've done many different flowers through the years. Um, this is one of my favorites. I love these wildflower thinlets, we've done them small. These are great for card sizes, but then we've also done them uh, a little bit bigger. And these larger elements are great for even things beyond the card, decor pieces. And my friend Debbie Adams created this years ago, and I love the sample so much that, that Mario got it for me. So thank you, Mario. I love it. Uh, and thank you, Debbie, thank you, for Debbie. creating it. But it was taking a die, okay? It's actually taking this die, just so you know which die it is, this yellow die. And this is what she created with it. What the what? what? The what? How on. cool is that? That is definitely a come on. I mean, Debbie Adams is just a genius for that. So it doesn't have to be an old watercolor set. This could be a brand new watercolor set from the dollar store, the kids craft section, and take, make a little hole in it if you want. Or in this case, she just hot glued them and then just painted over the glue blobs to look like paint blobs. You don't even have to dig out the paint. Take some of that watercolor, brush it onto the metal, let it dry so it just looks like an old tin. You can grunge it up easy, throw in a couple of old brushes and glue those flowers in. So she just took, and my paint brushes sit in there. So she just took this die, but by cutting it out of white cardstock, went in and added colors and then just stuck it on uh, with some wire. So you can see the wires in the back, there are the mechanics. So you could add a little flexibility, you can you know, bend them, you can have them you know, facing forward, it's just floral wire. You could, always, you could use sticks, but I think wire is just a little bit more flexible, but how great is that? That's a, a wonderful display to create for yourself or a creative friend. Maybe you have a creative friend that you wanna make for, and it just takes paper, a little color, and some paint sets. So even if you found shorter ones, 
bonus on you because then you only have to make four or five flowers, you know, versus the whole rainbow. But I think what a great display piece and just the fact that they all different heights and the fact of how she colored them, did a little pen work. So you can see that little, little detail bit. I mean, Debbie Adams, that's just brilliant. And I've, I've kept it in my studio for years. I don't even know the year that she made this, but I always thought what a great idea to take a die and put it onto an object. We often see that, you know, on, on a book or a box, but to put it in a paint tin, this is, this is maker all the way. So think about that. Think about doing it. And you wouldn't even have to do the same flower. You can make an entire garden uh, by cutting different flowers and adding that. But for over three years. I wanted to share the idea. I love it. It's, yeah. it's just super clever and super fun uh, way to incorporate dyes in a different way. So a lot of ideas with dyes. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Oh, so many ideas. Ooh. I'm going to move some stuff. Okay. Next, we're going to talk stamps because we need to talk some stamps. We'll talk about a, a few things. Uh, would you mind grabbing my media mat? I think I, I think I might get a little inky. I think I'm, I'll do some talking, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm itching to get a little inky. Okay. We talked about this guy in, uh, in the live. Thanks Mario in January. See, wasn't even planning. And here it is. This is how I roll. Whatever my brain wants to do, it's going to do. All right. I'm going to zoom in real quick just to get rid of that little light right there. So bear with me. Sometimes my camera cooperates and sometimes here we go. Sometimes it gets a little cranky. There we, there we are. Perfect. That's a little tip. If you're ever doing lives and you have light in there, if it's just on the edge, just zoom in, that'll crop it out. It's easier than trying to move the light into space to try to get rid of it. Um, all right. So this guy, this is the, the hipster bunny. That's that clear set I did with Stampers Anonymous, uh, available at Joanne's. It's also available on a couple of websites. We saw that, that uh, went in and, and got it and they're selling it. So you can get it. Even if you're, uh, you don't live in the U S there's, uh, online sites that ship that went in and bought it and they're happy to sell it. So the cool thing about this guy, he was just fun. I talked about uh, layering, but what I didn't talk about is really how I colored this. So he's just done using distressed watercolor pencils. Uh, the reason I, I chose to use distressed watercolor pencils on this one is because I wanted to stamp him on craft. So I stamped in distress archival just so I had something waterproof. Any, any kind of waterproof ink is going to work. You do not have to stamp in this one. This is just my ink of choice, but any permanent ink. And then I just went in and colored with the distressed watercolor pencils. These are a water reactive pigment and it contains white set one create contains white. And that's very nice because it allowed me to watercolor white and pink over Brown. Could you do this with acrylic paint? Yes. Could you do this with, um, picket fence distress? Yes but this is going to give me the most opacity because it is just a woodless pencil, water reactive pigment scribble on there and then just go in with a water brush and blend. Uh, if you want to add some other elements, you can stamp a second time, do some double stamping, but that's really how I added the color, the stenciling, cause it comes with the stencil. Just do a little stencil brush. You can use oxide like I did here because oxide will show up on craft like paint, or you can do ink, but just some fun ideas that I really didn't kind of cover that detail. So I wanted to mention it in this slide. Okay. Really good. Anytime you want to color on craft, this is going to be uh, so much more visually vivid than a marker or an ink because you're dealing with a pigment in the pencil. Okay. But let's talk about some other stuff. Would distress crayon work as well on craft? It works. Okay. Um, distress crayon just has a, a different viscosity. Someone asked if distress crayon would work the same on craft. It definitely works on craft paper. It just has a different viscosity. So you may need to, to maybe do, two layers of crayon to get it to be this opaque, but you might be perfectly happy uh, with the results of that. So definitely try it. If that's what you have, definitely try it. Okay. So stamps, we're going to, I'm going to bring in these cause I just want to do a, a cool kind of watercolory technique. I want to show us simple way that we can add, add ink. And maybe we'll even do some backgrounds depending on what you guys want to see. I don't know. At this point, I kind of have no agenda. I shared all the ideas and now we're just going to, play. Uh, did I, did I stencil first or last? Ooh, good question, Mel. Probably me would be last. And here's why. Um, I, I like to do things as a fill in the blanker, right? I, I guess I kind of work, uh, Mel asked, did I stencil first or, or last on this for me? I always prioritize my makes by whatever I want to do. So in this case, it was all about the bunny. So that was first. That's the first thing on the paper. The first thing I colored, whatever. And then I just go in with the stencil and fill in the blanks because if I were to stencil the whole background with ink, and then I try to watercolor, 
if I re-wet that brown ink, it's going to turn the white brown. Or I didn't want maybe a plaid going across his forehead. So that's really why I just use a stencil, uh, I guess, backwards. And, and people, listen, I get, I've gotten emails for years. Ever since I did these kind of stencils with Stampers Anonymous, the emails, they come and then they go in the delete file. Um, because this is, look, if you, wanna, if, if you want a large stencil, I get that. There are many companies out there that make big stencils, sheet stencils, six by six, 12 by 12. You do, you do you. For me, a stencil is always a fill in the blanker. So that's why I love the whole tag system because I didn't want to get in the habit of slapping down a stencil, inking the whole thing, and then trying to deal with it. So a layering stencil, even these that we do in those clear sets, we call them Franken stencils, Ted calls them that, because it's like two parts of a, there, this stencil, there's actually a, a full version of this stencil and a full version of this stencil in the line. But this allows me to just place that stencil, take, I like to work with a blending brush, which I don't think I have one over here. Um, I think I do, yeah I do, I do, I do. Um, I would work with a blending brush because that's gonna give me the most detail uh, versus a blending tool. So I like to work with this. And then I would just go in and ink some areas, but see, I can see where my image is. So that allows me to put some down and then I can move that over here. And you can visualize like, okay, that's pretty much where that lines up and I'll ink some over here. And then I can move some down and ink that here. And I can work around that to kind of fill in the blanks. So that's really how I like to just go in and, and add add a design. I appreciate that sometimes people want an entire stenciled background and there are stencils for that just just not in this line so that's why i do the layering stencils and, and i like that i also like to print with them and i think it's also uh, a good reminder that you can use tools in different ways it doesn't always have to be uh, one specific way to do it and th this is the benefit of a brush versus foam i'll do that demo less talky more dewy okay why not yep uh could you do me a favor in sure. the front of that file hand me the media grip real quick thank you very much there's File. Yep, you'll see like the plastic files in the very front. Just grab that whole stack of them because I don't know what size I'm going to need. Sure. And I'll just give you a quick, uh, oh, there we go. That's going to work. <laughs> That's uh, what you wanted? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I'm just trying to take these out. There we go. Okay. Let's see what I need. Okay, I'm just going just gonna to throw down some media grip real quick. So this is a media grip. I've just already cut it. So that's going to hold my ink pad. And then I'll just do... A card size one. I have them cut for different things, cards, tags, stencil. It just depends on what I want to do. Uh, I think because I'm in a stencil, I'll use the one I use for stencil. Because you can wash and reuse this indefinitely. That's what I like. And it's also heat stable. So let's just place some of this media grip down right on that glass. Then I'll take a piece of cardstock. I'll show you the same cardstock I did. So we're just going to use uh, craft. We'll take that stencil because it's already out. Um, I like this because, I mean, I know everybody, again, has different things. Some people like to tape. Some people like to use magnets. For me, I'm still going to use my hand to support it. So by having this on the grip, it's just going to keep everything in place anyway. But again, you do what works. So let's show the difference between a blending foam with a stencil and a brush. Because you can use both tools. I just think they're a little different. So here I'm just going to use some. The grip holds the ink pad, so I can just ink up the, the blending tool. So we'll do the same plaid. And I'll just take the blending tool and just kind of go over the top of this. Okay, nice. Stencil would be normal. Even if you pounce it, that's fine. And then I'll take that same and we'll use a blending brush. So the cool thing about a distressed blending brush, it is a, it's a natural fiber versus synthetic. Um, I like the fact that it's domed. It's not flush, it's not flat. Um, and I also like the fact that if I use it with this retracted, meaning the metal, this metal piece right here slides forward and backwards, I can really brush on the color, right? If I'm just doing, say, a light inking, or I can slide this forward, and that's going to create that kind of compact bristles, and that allows me to go into more of the detailed areas, like the, the lines. So I'm just gonna use it essentially the same way, circular motion. Uh, you can follow the pattern with a brush, that's fine. And then you can determine like how dark you want something to be. I normally just follow whatever the, the design is or shape. So I might start with a, a light inking and then focus to something you know, more compact, especially if you're doing different colors. But the, the difference between those tools to me 
is the detail. Okay, a brush is going to get into the grooves and give you sharper corners because the bristles can actually go into every little area of your cutout. Foam, although it can go in even if you pounce it, everything is skinnier and rounded, right? It doesn't have those crisp lines, especially if you're doing things like a flourish or anything that has a more a detailed design. A brush is always going to give you, in my opinion, better results when you're inking through a stencil uh, versus a blending tool. Blending tool is great for blending, but not necessarily for stenciling, in my opinion. So there you go. There's that kind of side by side so you get it. But you again, you can some people totally perfect working with a blending tool. So this year you're going to slide this all the way up to put those bristles away. It's got a little bump there for that lid, a little bump to catch that lid. And I just use a Sharpie um, to color mine. So I just take a Sharpie and roll around it. It wears off and then you reapply. But I just have one brush for each uh, color, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and brown. Uh, you could use them for oxide or ink. You just have to wipe them off on a damp cloth in between to clean them, or you could have a separate set, whatever works. Okay, so let's talk about, I'm just gonna pull off this grip for now. I may bring it back in. We're gonna talk about watercolor stamping. Now, watercolor stamping is really easy to, uh, to do. You can use markers, you can use ink pads, you can use a lot of things. But because it's springtime, I wanted to just throw in a little kind of different color. So, uh, where is it? It's in this one. Okay, so these guys, mica stains, these are part of the distress line. These come out in, in the season, Halloween and Christmas. There's a, a whole variety of colors and it creates a beautiful palette. And the, these mica stains, they have a color, but you see that shimmer? Whoa, that light is super bright. I probably should have turned that down before the live, but you can see it's got a really great reflection uh, because it has a luminous mica as part of the colorant. We also have these colors in crayons. So for those asking about crayons, uh, it has that same shine and you can use the crayons on craft. I think the, the mica shows up so well on craft because it's not just a white pearl, it's a color pearl. So the color of the pearl matches the color of the actual pigment, whether it's the crayon or the stain. So you can spray these for backgrounds. We may even do a couple backgrounds, I'm not sure. Um, but I think this is the video that I asked Zoe. I'm like, I cannot find where I did it. Cause apparently after I did this, I didn't blog about it or, and I never put it on Instagram. Um, it lives on Facebook and I, I don't know when I did it. I, I forgot to even look at the date, but this was about, uh, asking Ranger if they would sell, uh, empty bottles, empty alcohol ink bottles and or spray bottles to essentially take some of our stain and instead of everything being a spray, turn it into like a liquid watercolor. Cause my first hack, I tried to buy little paint cups at the craft store and they were leaking. It was a hot mess. So these are the alcohol ink bottles. We swatch them. They fit in the alcohol ink tin, but these are all mica stains. So we just added some color to the label to swatch them. So now I have uh, not only my stains in the spray, but I also have them in a little bottle. Now to, to kind of decant it, to take it from one place to the next, you would, you would unscrew the top and there's all your ink. First you would shake it. You would get it all mixed because you want to get all that mica mixed up. And then you would go in with, I think I have one. I always have one handy. You'd go in with like a pipette. Ranger has these as well, just plastic. And you would suck up some of the ink from this and you would take your empty bottle because it comes with bottles. It comes with this little ball bearing, which is super important because that's what breaks up uh, the mica, right? If you don't have anything smashing against that mica, it just stays as a clump. So you have to mix it up and you squeeze some in. How much do you put in there? However much you want to put in. I mean, maybe we did like not even half of a, a bottle, but it depends on if you're going to use a lot of this, you might want to put more in there. But here's the updated tip that was not in that video uh, that my friend Kath Stewart shared with me. Because in the video, after I decanted it, um, I had to put, then you put the ball bearing in. So you put your liquid in, put your ball bearing in, just visualize. And then you need to put the nib in and the nib is a friction fit. I was like struggling so hard with my thumb to try to get this in there. And it, it just couldn't, I was really struggling, but I did it. I mean, I did that one, one time and then I was like, oh my gosh, how is anyone else going to do it? And Kath, thank you, Kath, shared this tip. So here's the tip. It's really important that you do it properly though. Once you put your liquid in and you have your ball bearing, you're going to take the nib and you're going to seat it into the top. And you, and when I say seat, it means it needs to be upright. It can't be like at an angle like that. 
you'll you'll be able to like push it in past that there's almost like a first little ring and it kind of just stays there for a minute then you're going to take the top you're going to put the lid so once this is pushed in so it's not you can see it's not clicked in all the way but i need to see this you're going to put the lid on and you're just going to start turning 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 and you're going to turn it until you hear it like pop you'll like Man. feel this little click Done. shut up done good. flush finished brilliant that was it like so simple to do and now that seated perfect it's not going to leak it's great but then here's the other thing that kind of crossed my mind um just yesterday so i i text the owner of ranger on you know friday night i'm like i know it's end of day but hey <laughs> would you consider offering replacement nibs because when you buy this it's kind of like the whole set you get the bottle the caps everything you need to make the set i think they sell them in a set of 12 or six i'm sorry um but if you have to refill this you have to remove this nib and the only way to remove this nib is with a pair of pliers which i've already done for the purpose of this demo and can you see how that little nib is like kinked when you take needle nose pliers and you pop this off you've essentially like bent this nib you've kinked it and i said would you just consider like selling a replacement pack of nibs so they're going to add them to the site if they didn't do it today maybe they'll do it uh, by monday but this way if you need to pull this off because you need to refill it or for whatever reason I don't like to reuse it because again, it, it has that kink in there. And that means the mica is going to get clogged up in there. So yes, they are going to offer replacement nibs. So when you pull this off, you just put that on. I think it's going to be like, you know, 12 for a dollar or something. It's not a huge, it's not a huge cost, but it's something that's going to maintain this idea if that's how you like to use it. Okay. So I'll just take a few colors. Haven't used these probably since, well, since the last time maybe we demo, I'm going to take a couple of greens. I do love that green. That's good. Probably maybe a little orange. Maybe we'll do a little, little purple. Isn't that interesting how that one purple, it's the only color that like stains the bottle. That's got to be some intense, intense dye. Um, okay. I think I'm good with those colors. No, maybe not. All right. Now I'm, I should be good. Am I good? Almost. Okay. Now I'm good. I just want to kind of set this aside because I can go crazy. I like to set these down on their sides. So that's going to get the mica to kind of lay across. I'm going to put up just a little, little piece of grip here because that's going to, that'll just kind of hold on to these just as I'm using these. All right. So what, what we can do when it comes to working with these colors is treat them as you would a watercolor or an ink. Okay. You can shake this up, kind of get that, that mixing ball to kind of really mix up that mixture. You want to make sure that you don't have anything set at the bottom. So the reason on the side is it will start kind of pulling this, this mica powder slowly but surely. Not that big of an issue with these little shakes, but certainly a bigger issue with uh, sprays. You can work right on the craft mat if you're working on a medium mat. You can treat a palette however you want, but because this comes with a built-in palette, I'm going to use it. So I'm just going to remove the craft mat so I have my palette squares. Because this way, I can set this up in in rainbow order, if you will. So I'm just gonna start. Mario, you wanna shake some of these? Sure. Do a little dance back there? He won't dance, but here you go. I'll give these to him. Maybe okay. shake them simultaneously. Yeah, you got it. All right, I'm just gonna build a quick palette and I don't wanna bore you with shakety shake. But again, if you don't have mica stains, you can do this with reinkers. You can do this with any type of concentrated color, but I love the mica because it's very, it's very shimmery. And especially for a springtime make, why not bring on a little bit of the, the shimmery stuff? So I'll just take this. Ooh, I'm going to add a little, little bit in there. A little shake, drip. Shake. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. One by one by one. Okay. Add some pink. I'm going to add a couple little drops of red. You don't need a lot. You, I mean, you can, you can use as much as you want, but you really don't need a lot of this at all. Any more? Okay. No, no I'm good. good. Do a little orange. So I'm just building this in rainbow order because then I'll just kind of know Roy G. Biv. Oh, you have to remember not to shake right before you open it. You see, I did, I did that twice. It's just because it adds that little bonus drop that you don't want, that I don't want. I do think I want a little more yellow though. There we go. Okay. 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 All right. Reading. <laughs> Pauline forgot that from grade school. I, yeah, I've always kind of thought that for the rainbow. Now by shaking these up, the thing about mica stain, I'll talk about that while I'm just doing kind of this busy work. Um, 
The thing about mica stain that I love is that once you shake it, the mica is fused to the ink itself, to the colorant. That's what makes mica stains so unique is that even when you're coloring, the ink and the pearl are, they become one. That to me is, is really cool. Uh, did he dilute them? I did not dilute them. I just used them right out of the, right out of the sprayer. So we have a concentrated color because we're going to color them. You could watercolor with them. So I don't dilute them ahead of time. I take them right out of the bottle as they, as they are. Okay. There's a palette. I could have used some brown, but I'm not going to this time. Okay, so some things that we can do. One, we can color with those, and, and I'll, I'll color with those in, in a bit. But let's just start with just a, the idea of a stamp. I'll take this media grip out of the way. What's great about working with uh, these colors is that it does give you a whole fluid kind of watercolory look, and this is just right out of the bottle uh, concentrated. But you can also dilute the color depending on how you want to use it. So I'll start with just some watercolor cards. Oh my gosh. You would think that I'm like super ready, but I'm just gonna, I'll just use this. Okay. I just don't, I just didn't need anything like this big, but that's okay. I'll cut this real quick. Oh, that'll give me a chance to talk about the cutter. Nice. Look at that. See, I'll just, cause this is sitting on my table. Okay. Not a, not a demo for the rotary cutter, but I will answer a quick thing. Uh, if you have this or if you've, if you've read anything online, one of the things that I see people doing uh, wrong on this one um, is that when you go to use this cutter, it has this wiggle. You have to have your hand here, your thumb here, and the blade needs to be turned into this metal edge. If you just have your hand flat, the blade is actually not resting up against the metal edge of this trimmer, and it's not going to give you a clean cut. If you just rest your palm and slide it like other trimmers, it's going to give you a jagged cut. You need to put your thumb in there, rest your hand here, which now pushes the blade. You don't have to use pressure. You just need to use the weight of your hand and it rests the blade against this metal edge. And that's what's going to allow this to just cut clean. Nice so, job. yeah, so that's, and also like if you're, if you're using it on the bottom edge, you're going to cut from the top because you want it to push up against that edge as resistance. Uh, if you're using it at the top, you're going to push up from the bottom because if you start from the same end and you're pushing, you could have a tendency to have your card shift, even if you're holding it down. So just always get in the habit also of kind of the opposite, opposite end. So that gave me a, that gave me a good chance to just talk about that quick little tip. But yeah, cause people I think are just used to, if you had a rotary cutter, you just kind of set your hand down instead of using the cush grip. That's why we put that grip on the carriage because of how it's supposed to be used. So it makes it, makes it really work. Okay. I'm just going to take a stamp. Um, I'll, I'll just start with something, something simple and basic. It could be anything you want it to be. And you can do this many ways. And I've done this many ways. You can spray down on a craft mat and you can actually tap, tap, tap a stamp into it. Or in this case, if you have a palette, you can just pick up a, a brush and actually paint your colors on there. Whatever colors you want to do of the mica stain, we can paint this onto the stamp. And it just depends on how much color you want to put on there. I have a little cup of water, I'm just going to clean in between. And I'm going to see, have I done this before? Uh, not with this product. I've just done it with re-inkers, but hey, this is how I like to roll. I do. Uh, I think I'm going to go in with some, I'll just do a little bit of blue. And stain, what's, what's crazy about stain is it because it's so fluid, um, it just kind of does weird stuff when it touches a stamp. I'm even going to throw in some purple. I'm just going to kind of mix those two up. Okay. It definitely does something a little bit weird on the stamp. So I've got just some mica stains on the stamp. Not, not a ton. I'm just going to mist it with water. Just give it a couple of sprays with this. And then on watercolor cardstock, because that's going to give me, I think, uh, the best result. I'm just going to stamp that, lift it up, and we're going to dry it with a heat tool. I can see I need a little bit more on the edge and do it again, but I'm still, I'm still loving this one. So I'm not giving up on that. Now you can stamp on the textured side or the smooth side. It's completely up to you. It just depends on uh, how much color you want to, to sit. So this one was smooth. Let's do this one on the textured side, just so you can see the difference. Um, that purple is super intense from that blue. I still like it, but I want to have a little bit more blue. So I'm going to go back with my brush. I just like to dry it off so because these are already super fluid. See, I knew I would want more color. 
Oh, let's do more of that blue. Nice. Very nice. We'll do a little teal. I know. I do like it. A little bit of teal there. Nice. Okay. I like it. Coloring to me is like, it's so zen. Oh my gosh. I don't often, well, one, I'm not really good at coloring, but I don't often color during a live because I just kind of zone out. That's it. Okay. Mic is staying again. A couple sprays of water. Why the water? Well, we want the colors to blend, but we also want them to be fluid enough because I want it to look like watercolor. And sometimes you can even give it like a good little tap. Sometimes you'll get an extra little bit of splash like I did, which I love. Um, do you have to use a heat tool to dry it? No, you can let it air dry. I prefer to dry with a heat tool because I'll, I'll get more chunkity bits, if you will, or like pools of color without it spreading out. But what I find so, I love this one even better. I like the textured side for sure of this one. Um, what's nice about doing this technique is not only to get the color, but see, you get that, you get that shine, that luminous, and this light is blasting it out, but really it's such a, it's such a beautiful shimmer on there, but you have the coloration of, of the dye in there with that little bit of mica. And it's something that, you know, maybe you have done this with your ink pads. Cause I mean, I've done this with distress pads for years where you take your little ink cubes and do it, but it's another way to use maybe a product that maybe you haven't used since Christmas or Halloween or at all for that matter. You know, you just haven't, haven't taken it out and maybe sprays aren't your thing. And that's another thing that sometimes as makers, <clears throat> we kind of determine how we make and the viability of a product where you'll look at that and go, oh, mica stains, yeah, that looks pretty, but I don't, I don't spray, it's too messy. I get that, maybe you don't wanna, I didn't spray for years. But knowing that the ink is good, the ability to put it in another type of container of how you might work, maybe you're gonna brayer this or maybe you're gonna do all your coloring, that to me is what's always important to remember um, as a maker. So to clean the stamp, I'm um, just gonna spray this. I'm gonna actually try to get one more, one more stamping out of it. I see a little color there, so I just, Sprayed it with some more water and we'll stamp it again. Okay, I like that. The thing about watercolor stamping, don't be judgy McJudge to yourself. So many times people will do watercolor stamping and they'll stamp it and they're like, oh, I hate it. Oh, it looks messy. Oh, I can't see it. You gotta wait for it to dry. You still might hate it after it's dry. I'm not saying that's gonna change your mind, but I will tell you that watercolor stamping should look like watercolor. It should be very fluid. It should have those great little organic imperfections. That's the magic of watercolor. You can go and use your blending tool. You can do all that. If you don't want it to look like watercolor, then you probably shouldn't watercolor. You should instead use an ink pad and then just stamp it and you'd have a great silhouette. And sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. You might be like, thanks Captain Obvious for telling us. But you know, you look at a technique and you're like, oh, I hate this, it looks terrible. Well, then you're never gonna like the technique because you don't like the look. So. I'm just drying this off just with a cloth. I'll stick the stamp down. Let's do another color because I do want to do something. Oh, I'll do this one. It's a nice big one. I'll slap that down. And we'll do some, I do have another sheet. Okay. We'll do some yellows this time. Just some different yellows and browns. And the colors, I think in, a, in this particular one, especially like this one, we'll go back to this, this purpley blue one. You see the nice thing about uh, having that little bit of blue, although I didn't put enough ink there, I'm still okay with it because you don't know, it looks like a pressed flower to me, uh, but adding two different colors, now I'm getting a little bit of blue pearl on that purple. It's pretty. Okay. So let's take this one, just again, going in with the brush, I'll start with uh, some yellow. So I've got lots of yellow up here. Uh, and you, you want to be, I mean, you want to be fairly generous, but you just don't want to go too crazy. It's not going to, I'll hold it up again to the, the camera. It's not going to hold on to uh, the stamp like an ink pad does. It's fluid. So I'm just going to do a little bit of orange. That's probably a little too much. So let me just move some of that down. Okay, good. And we'll get into some greens. And I'm just going to follow the line. And I, it's okay to paint off the edge. So if you don't have a steady hand, this is also really good for you because you can totally go off the off the path with this. Okay, got some green in there. Don't have much of this light green, but I'm still gonna throw it in. And let me wash my brush. And I'm gonna take a little bit of this teal. That'll give me just some little pops of color right there. And I'm gonna go back one more time to yellow. And each time I am just kind of wiping my brush off because I don't want to add too much water to this. It's just going to make it a little bit more 
challenging. So this is that case that you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. I mean, the, the beauty of watercolor stamping. Oh, I want a little bit more green down there. See right there where it's totally dry? There we go. Okay. So that's what we've got on our stamp. Pretty fluid. Not pooling off, certainly not running off the, the rubber, but there's quite a bit on there. Mist, because we just want that to be wet. Textured side. And let's stamp that down. Stamp with purpose. Hold it there for a second. Lift it off. Ooh, I like that. It's that little kind of thunk, which is kind of fun. Okay. Just drying this again. I do like drying with a heat tool just because all those drips and drops, it's really, really nice. So uh, there was a question, can you use a water brush? Oh yeah, good question. I would not recommend using a water brush for this because the color is so intense that your water brush will become that color for a long time. So rinsing, rinsing it out with a paintbrush. I mean, you can even see how much I wipe off in between. It's a lot of color on the brush. So in fact, I think the first time I demoed this during one of the holiday ones, I actually did use a water brush. Um, and it was like red and I just kept wiping and wiping just to try to get that color out. So if that's all you have, then yes, you could use it, but it's, it's much more challenging to clean the color out between colors. So that's why I chose a paintbrush because I do have my water brush right here, but I'll choose to use it for other things, uh, except, you know, unlike the, the mica stain. So look at that, that beautiful. See that orange actually really was nice. It kind of rose to the top. See that little introduction of blue, those little greens. And it's the textured paper also that's creating that additional wicking. So there again, if you don't like that additional wicking, go on the smooth side of the watercolor paper because Distress watercolor cardstock is smooth and textured uh, depending on the size, the side that you use. So yeah, quite fun. And we can do inking and we can do splattering. I mean, there's a, a whole lot of other things we can do to this background. You know, we might want to, let's dry this just a little bit. Let's add just a little bit of, a little bit of schmutz to it because we can. Let's see, I know I have an ink pad here. Uh, normally I would work on a craft mat. I'm gonna get better spots, but we're gonna see what we can do here. I'm gonna throw a little bit of ink down right there, a little bit of water, break it up, because we don't, it's just gonna come off of, on your fingers. Just break that up, because if you don't break it up, then when you put it in there, it's gonna look like the square of the ink pad. Um, if you think you have too much, edit, and then we'll just take this and just do a couple of little tip taps. There we go. And we're gonna dry it. Just gonna dry in between layers. And I'm keeping some of the smaller drips on here. This may, you know, totally put you over the edge and freak your freak because you don't like it. Um, but this is actually working, not having the mat in place because it's, it's creating definitely more of a water, a watery drip. So I like that. But I wouldn't normally uh, use a craft mat if I'm gonna do a monoprint, but this one's big splotchy thing. So I'm good with that. And you'll tell like this big splotch is because it's glass and not, it doesn't hold on to the individual beads the way a craft mat. But I love how this, look how this flower just kind of floats off the edge. Yeah, that's my jam. See, I like that, just changes it. So does it have to be brown? No, brown is my comfort zone. If yours is blue or pink, you might wanna do a little splash but it's it's a great way to kind of fill in a background maybe you like simple is better maybe you want to stamp a little text there's a lot of ideas that you can do but it's just about taking stamps that you might have or stamps that you may maybe haven't used in a long time and reimagining it with something new it doesn't mean you can't do this with your ink pads if that's what you have that's what you should do as long as you're you're doing something you're making that to me is the most important part of this i'm looking for the towel and it's in my pocket okay so far, so good, right? You guys doing okay? Okay, so the thing to also keep in mind is that if you're working with stamps and this technique, a, a more solid stamp is going to be a better approach for watercolor. The reason is, is because it is so fluid, we need the surface of the stamp to be able to hold that color. Even if it doesn't cover it all the way, you saw that because I had those big beads of ink on the flower, when you stamp it down, those spread out and they spread out to the edge of your stamp. If you have something that's detailed, you can get away with, with stamping. In fact, I'll stamp one of these butterflies just to show you, but chances are you're not gonna have any detail. You're only gonna have the shape of that stamp. 
it won't be as solid as a silhouette stamp, but you're certainly not going to have all those little lines and details. And so you need to be aware of that because sometimes people choose the wrong image for a technique because they're like, oh, I want to do that. And then every time you stamp it, you're like, it's a hot mess. Well, it also depends on the image you're trying to use to get it to have that, that look. So I think I'll use, um, let's use this one. Okay. So this one will be fine. Be a nice little butterfly. Let's take some colors. I almost added some, need to add a little bit more blue. And I think I'm going to add a little bit more. I haven't used pink, so I don't know if blue is a good idea, but we're going to go for it anyway. A couple of drips. And that's the other nice thing about this bottle is because it's an alcohol ink bottle, it's easy to control how much you put out there because you can see you still have a lot of, it's still a lot of ink there. So for this one, I'm just going to start with, uh, I'm going to go in with some pinks probably pink and yellow and red and I'll throw in some blue because then we'll get a purple somewhere which I think will be okay I'll take a little bit of red bring that on I'm just going to wipe it onto the glass at this point because I'm going to clean this up in just a second and then I'm going to pick up some blue which I've now turned into green and I'm okay with that I'll throw that down there I'll put a little bit of purple why not it's like just just make it a big mess Tim go right ahead Take some green. This is for not cleaning your brush, and that's okay. All right, I'm okay with that. You get what you get. Okay, watercolor cardstock, textured side, stamp, get a little blast, splat. Lift, ooh, yes. Beautiful. I love that. I knew that blue was going to turn a little muddy there and I'm okay with it. I'll catch it on the second one. But I love this one. I have enough ink that I really, I want to, I want to do that again. I'm just going to add a little bit more ink to just some of that area. I'll just take that off where I think it got a little muddy and we'll add some of that brighter blue in there. Ooh, it still might get muddy, but that's, I mean, it's the serendipitous uh, nature of what watercolor stamping does that I just find fascinating but some people really they absolutely hate the imperfections i think once you learn to embrace them mm, so good okay take this so here i just added a little bit you can see i added some more blues in there little touches of uh, yellow whatever was left on there and some pink and we'll do the same thing just going to kind of stamp that at, at an angle so my second generation will be lighter, but what's nice, you'll see the second generation is actually a little bit more airy in the image because, oh, I set that right in that ink. Look at that. Let's wipe that off. There we go. Um, the stamp has a little bit more open space, right? That design. So you'll see that between these two, that was our first one that we did. Still beautiful. See, it's just, it just looks watercolored. It, it doesn't look like you stamped, that's for sure. And then there is that second generation, a little bit more open space because again, all we added uh, was a little bit more blue and some yellow. We didn't re-ink the entire stamp. So, you know, if, if you can try to get a second generation every time, because I think there's enough ink, especially if you remember to spray it with water and it just creates something, I mean, literally we're just with drops of ink, we've been sitting here playing and playing and playing with uh, creating all sorts of different backgrounds using strips of paper. So it's a, it's a great way that you could incorporate your stamps with another product for the Easter and springtime. You could do this any time of year, of course, but I always like to remind you of getting out your stuff and, and using it. So real quick, before we move on to uh, the last thing, we'll talk about just stamping and coloring because there was that question about uh, just coloring with these if you wanted to. So I'll start with my archival. I'm going to stamp in something waterproof. I'm going to choose a stamp that I think, well, maybe that, maybe that was the one that had the most open space. And eh, pretty much. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to choose the same stamp because I don't have the right stamp to show you uh, for this, but I'm going to make this work. I'm going to use some archival. We'll stamp this. Normally, I would stamp on a stamp tool. Hey, I think I have it. Hold this thought. Yeah, Mario just Mario just tapped me and he's like, yeah, I had it, thanks. <laughs> I did prep it, I did, but in my brain, I didn't think I had it here. Okay, 
I like to work on, uh, for this technique, I like to work with a, a stamp tool. I'm working with the stamp platform because I have the ability to multi-stamp. That to me is, is easier if you're doing mica stain and I'll explain why in just a minute, all right? So I'll start, let me just open this up. I wanna make sure I don't smash into that watercolor. I do have a piece of media grip down here because that to me helps everything stay put. I can still use a magnet. It even grips the magnets. Those are strong. Yeah, they are strong. There we go. We'll just put them right there. Um, if, you, if you have this tool and you work with it, remember when you're, when you're using this lid because it does rubber and clear, put your pressure down with your, with your fingers before you close and pick up the stamp. Because again, this has a little play, it has a little play because it can be flipped for rubber clear. But if you, cause sometimes people will pull this back when they stamp and sometimes they push. And if you don't remember if you pushed or pulled, you may not line up your stamp. So if you always have your finger resting on this little rounded ridge, when you close the lid, then you should always stamp in a, in a better position. May not always work, just depends. Most of the time I don't pay attention. Okay, I'm going to stamp with this. So now when I do the same thing, I always have my, my pressure on there and I'll give it just a little stamping, stamp with purpose, open it up and I'm leaving everything here. Now I'll go in with a brush. I'll take a smaller brush. In fact, I don't mind showing you a water brush so you can see what I was talking about as far as cleaning. Um, but when you go to pick up a little color in this, see how quick it wicks up into that nib? So the entire thing, like when I go to paint with it, it's just gonna keep coming out. So that's why I don't really like to work with a water brush. It, it just takes a little bit too much time to change between colors. Okay, so I'm gonna go to a paintbrush, get a little wet, and let's just add some color. We'll add a little bit of orange. So now I'm just coloring directly over stamped image. And I'll, ex I'll explain why. They're, the reason I like to kind of do a double stamping is because of the, the mica, the mica in here is actually a pigment and pigments are opaque. And you have to be mindful of that, especially if you're stamping it over an image. And I'll, when I'm done coloring, I'll hold it a little closer because maybe you're not seeing what's happening. But as that mica starts to dry, even if I'm coloring on the open areas, it sits on top of that black and I personally don't like that. You might like it, that's fine, but I don't. So on this black area, I'm not gonna color that black body because you're not gonna see it, we're stamping. I'm only focusing the color uh, on the open areas. Let's see if I can pick up a little bit more down to my last little bits of, ah, oh, there we go. There was enough mic in there to really shine that up. I'm gonna bring a little bit of purple. The colors are super intense. It's crazy how intense the the colors are when working with these. Let's see if there's any yellow. Maybe. Uh, enough to add some little gold. Okay. See, it's so quiet in here when I'm coloring. It's so nice. It's so nice. Okay, I'm gonna add a little red because I want to. Okay, I'm gonna blend that in. Okay, let's blend that. Let's use this because it's the only color I haven't used. It's, it's actually mud and that's fine. Okay, so here's what we have. Let me just show you before I do the next part. So it's beautiful, it's great color, but what's happening, I need to get rid of that little nugget of mica right there, um, is it's sitting on top of my image. And you could leave it like that. There's nothing wrong with it, but you, I think you lose a lot of definition. So I'm just gonna take a brush and pick up that little, little bit of pearl. So I want this to dry. Now in videos, you may have seen me use my heat tool on this surface. You can use a heat tool, not an embossing gun, and you could be quick like this and let it cool. You cannot just continuously heat on this. This is still plastic. Even though the grip is, is heat stable, it creates a barrier, you shouldn't be embossing or doing anything on, on your platform or you'll warp it. But a, a couple little seconds of heat is gonna be fine. So next I'm just going to stamp it a second time. Same thing, archival, my image didn't move. Hopefully my paper didn't move, but one never knows with me. We'll see, you get what you get. Okay, I'm gonna ink that up. Place my hand down, a little pressure. Ah, that's just what I wanted. So look at the difference now when I hold it up. See the difference? You see how all those lines are now on top of the mica, whereas before the mica covered up your image. So double stamping when you're using mica or pencils, anything with a pigment, uh, I do this with paint, I do this with distressed pencils. So I did that with the hipster bunny. Uh, and of course I do it with mica. Double stamping makes a difference because if you're watercoloring with ink, just ink, distress ink, that's translucent. 
But anything else, distress oxide, that has a pigment in it. Pencils, pigment, mica stain, pigment. A pigment is gonna dominate the dye. So when you color with that, you often cover up the details of what you're coloring. So just letting it dry and doing that second stamp in the same area of the same permanent ink uh, gives you uh, the, those wonderful details and you still get that luminous look and people would be like, what did you color with? That's amazing. You color with that. It's really cool. So anyway, I, I hope, you, hope you found that tip helpful because sometimes it's the little things that really you know, amplify the work. That's, I think, the important part. Okay. So here we go. And yeah, uh, the mica stains, because they're seasonal, you know, people that didn't get the first palette in, in 2021, they only got the set from 2022. It, you want to build those colors because those colors, as you can see, you can use them, you can use them year round. Okay. So reimagining or using things in, in a different way is, is the very thing that woke me up this morning. So I was done at this point. I was like, done, happy, good. Um, but then I had an idea, okay? And here's the idea. The idea sp sparked from this, which is, which is weird. I was like, oh, I love these carrots. This was so fun to do. I, I love how these were reimagined, real fun. But these are made with what? Anyone? A tree. So these are made with woodland trees. And I thought, well, hold on. If I'm doing some stamping and I'm doing all that, wouldn't it be cool if I could take something I had that was a bottle brush tree and do exactly the same thing and turn it into carrots. So it's exactly the inspiration from doing the woodland trees uh, for ideology and turn them into carrots. I did exactly the same thing with the bottle brush tree stamp set. You just turn it over and you have all these different carrots to choose from. Oh man, I missed it. I so, FedEx. sorry. So this, I just went and utilize this stamp set and I did the technique that I shared in the holiday hoopla which was and you could do a lot of different things but this was done using distress ink sticky embossing powder rock candy so the same way we made those glittery Christmas trees we just make the carrots come on come on is right and I, I can't believe I missed it that was the thing that was just like boom I needed to I just needed to wake up and like do it I had to get that out you there did and create so it good. It was so fun. So this, if you go back to the holiday hoopla, you'll see exactly how this technique is done. Essentially, it's just using your mini ink pads. Could you do this with mica stain? Yes, but because we're adding glitter, there's no reason to do mica because the glitter is what's adding that sparkle there. So you're stamping with these. I'm not stamping the wire. So for these carrots, I think I, I use this one. I use this tree. So I just inked up this area right here. I didn't ink this up stamped it, dried it. Then we go in with our embossing ink. These are all the tools. Again, the video demo is already done on the Hoopla. You can check it out, but I did embossing ink. Thanks, Mario. Uh, sticky embossing powder, get it sticky, sprinkle it with your rock candy. And then the raffia came in handy that I had from the other carrots that I pulled off. And all I did was attach it with a tiny attacher. So the tiny attacher was the easiest thing to just go into the top of that. So I actually slid it in from the side and boom, just attach that. So you didn't have to glue it. And I love the little staple. I think it gives it a whole little uh, great effect. These little sentiments, hippity hop and happy Easter, that came from uh, Crazy Talk, which was from the bird crazy and crazy cats and dogs. So there's happy Easter uh, in hippity hoppity because there's, a, there's sentiments for the whole year and they really play into that style and i think that that makes it really fun thanks i agree it was worth uh, getting up early because mario's like what are you doing i'm like this idea it was like just because of the carrot and bottle brush tree i'm like hold on i actually have a bottle brush tree stamp set how cute would that be to turn these into carrots and see if it works and that yeah was, that is a serious it was fun come on it come is a on. come on it's a lot of fun so this was um i kind of followed the same thing that i did during the hoopla so the same idea of building those cards but instead of splattering the cards with white paint i did black on craft because i thought that added like a little uh, speckled egg look and instead of doing glitter because i i didn't want to add sparkly things i inked the edges uh, used a trusty paper distressor you guys remember these i love this distressor from tonic so you know going in and just distressing that edge it made it look kind of more linen-y kind of fabric which i liked uh, and then I just put it on some ideology 
craft stock. And I love the Ideology craft stock because it does give, I think, a more organic look than regular cardstock because it is a craft core. And now that we have the sanding discs, it makes it super easy. So when I use a sanding disc, I normally just work on a piece of scrap chipboard. You can see there, I never sand on my mat. It's not good. Uh, and these sanding discs, they fit right on your blending tool. They have that same fabric backing that, that sticks onto the Velcro. But what's great about having it like this is now I can easily just go over the edges. I mean, you can go in a circular motion, but there's really no need. I like the, I like the striations, the lines, and I just, Rub that across. So here's what you know about craft stock. It sands off the color. This is a craft paper printed in color. So unlike green cardstock or pink cardstock or blue, that the actual pulp is a color. This is a printed ink. So it comes off when you sand it almost like paint dust. So uh, this makes it really nice. You can, all you have to do is just wipe this off on a cloth and that cleans up your sanding disc. These last a really long time, uh, but it makes sanding so much easier. And I thought nothing would be easier than the sanding grip, but these are. So then I like to wipe off any excess. So this is what I have is kind of my, my card base. And so far so good. I like that. But the other thing to know about craft stock is because it is a craft core, it's very porous, very absorbent. So, if we take our ink blending tool, you take an ink pad, it could be any kind of ink pad you want. I need to hold this on my grip out. And I'm just gonna ink the edges really quick. So remember another reminder when you're inking, keep your hand in the same spot, wherever you're comfortable and move the paper. Don't be a contortionist, just, you see my fingers just kind of moving. That's all you gotta do. You don't, you don't need to do this. That's not gonna give you uh, a very consistent or even ink blend. Then we can splatter this with a little bit of water. So now I'm just using the sprayer, but I'm just slowly, maybe the camera will pick it up. See those little spits that kind of, if you slowly do this, it kind of acts like a squirt gun to get those drips of water. I'm gonna let those drips of water sit there for just a second. If you wanna outline them a little bit, you can use a heat tool for just a couple seconds. We don't wanna dry the water. We just wanna dry the shape of the dot and then take something porous. Paper towel is gonna to be your best thing to literally lift those dots off exactly as they were. And it just creates a really cool modeled edge to it. So it shows your color, it shows the brown, but because we sanded it, that's where that ink really permeated the surface. And then if you want, you can ink the edges of this, as you saw, I inked the edges of mine, but you don't have to, you could, because that, that edge is inked, and then you could just stick that on a card. But quite fun. I just thought that, you know, these little sparkly bottle brush carrots with the inks, Again, it's all about technique. And that's what I was saying at the, the very beginning that sometimes when you, when you look around and you look around your creative space and you look for things uh, that inspire you, there are so many different things out there, right? Even, even older makes that you might see, even newer makes that you might see uh, online that inspire you, things that maybe you've seen in, in previous years, things that maybe you saw a die cut used uh, a different way like there's so many different ideas to to create with and that is what I love about the idea part of making that's that to me is is what I you can see I stepped on my mic again because I always do that um, but that's what I love and and that's why it's it's so important for me to uh, go on and just kind of remind you about the things the things that are there because often when I do uh, a live there's people that maybe didn't see a previous live and they're like, can you show that thing that you showed when you showed it before? Because I'm here in this one now. And, and sometimes I'll do that. But then at the end of the day, if I keep doing the same thing every time, all the videos have exactly the same content. And so I'm really being mindful of my time and yours. I mean, we've already uh, been hanging out for almost two hours, but about like, okay, if I can try to remember where, uh, where the videos are and what we've did, I can, Oh, hey, boo, uh, remind you of where you can go and find those. And also what's also important, if you haven't been to my YouTube channel, if you've only looked on um, the website, check out the channel I've put in a lot of work. A shout out to Julie for helping me as well. We try to go in and timestamp the videos now. So if you click the video uh, and you look in the description, you'll see timestamps. And what that is, it kind of breaks it down by chapters. So if you're looking for a specific part of a specific video, you can read through it. Like, let's say you want to see that bottle brush tree of the hoopla. You don't have to watch all of it. You can just go and like find where that demo was or in the case of 
Uh, I don't know if the hoopla is timestamped, by the way. It might be. Um, but like in the case of the Easter ones that we've done, because I know that's timestamped, you can go in and say, I just want to see Foundry Wax. You click that timestamp in the description box, and it will actually fast forward the video to that exact spot. So you don't have to find it. You don't have to do anything. If you read those boxes, you have to click show more to kind of see it. The other thing I did on my YouTube channel is I categorize things. So I kind of put seasonal makes in a category. So if you just want inspiration, you can click play all and watch a playlist of seasonal things or all the alcohol ink videos or all the videos on distress ink or all the Q and A videos. So there's different uh, categories within the channel. If you scroll down to uh, my YouTube channel and I do encourage you to please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Here's what I uh, asked Mario. I've been doing a lot of stuff about YouTube and reading things. And I turned my comments back on on YouTube because I heard that that would actually make my videos populate because I didn't know your videos could actually uh, not populate in the side if you don't have that open. So that's open now. Just something else to moderate. Um, but it's, a, it's nice because when people ask questions about a video, I'm able to actually address that question of that specific video. So that's been really helpful. Um, but also subscribing, you know, if you subscribe, it also allows more engagement in the chat, which is really great during these live streams. Uh, but it also ups the whole, I think, algorithm for YouTube. So uh, you, people that get notified when I go live, if you forget, you would have got a notification that I went live if you didn't turn on your notification for Instagram. So it's a lot of moving parts, but all to bring stuff to you. And I hope that by doing the timestamps, categorizing, putting links about previous videos, that you remember that the information is out there. And sometimes it's attached to a different theme or an idea, like the bottle brush tree, but I always try to make it relevant without doing the demo again and again and again. Sometimes I'll repeat it, you know, if I haven't done it in a, a few years, I need to, I need to do that. Um, but when it's just there and we just did it in the hoopla, go and check it out. It'll take a few minutes of your time to see it and then you'll be reminded of Christmas and for Easter. So uh, I hope, so, I had an idea. <laughs> it's not even a new color. Can we timestamp these? That's cute. That's nice. Yeah, thank you. Can we timestamp these? Timestamp. Yeah. Yeah. Timestamp, okay. why not? Okay. Here we go. Timestamp. Yeah, I should just step out of the way so he can have full view. There you go. I think these would make awesome timestamps. You don't even know what a timestamp is if you're talking like that. You do? Yeah. Uh, I know what it and is. And you think that'd yeah, make yeah. a good timestamp? Yeah. Yeah. I love the ears. I love how floppy they are. They're like little oh, fuzzy ears. Yeah, so, uh, so is that what you picked up when we were at Hobby Lobby yesterday? Because yeah. <laughs> really, when we were shopping, he goes, I'll go ahead and check out. And I was like, okay. Normally, we just go and check out together. I was like, okay. Yeah. Now I get it. They're perfect for you, Mario. They are perfect. I love that. Hey, Julie. You're Time hilarious. Stamp. So good. I love how your shirt matched, too. I was like, wow, hey. bright colors. I thought here you were just matching me. You I match your ears. ears. This guy right here, I tell you, he's the greatest. He's so fun. He's great fun. But that explains everything, because really, Abby Abby's like, oh, I'll check out. We'll be ready to go. I'm like, okay, sure. I thought, well, that's weird. You must be in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. I love the surprise. Thanks for always being full of surprises. This, this it's one, fun. I broke one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's so, so good. I do. I love, uh, yeah, I always love just being surprised. You, you are the best. No, no, really. I'm, I'm good. I'm sure I could, but they're all, they're you. I can't believe they're that it just came when That's you were, had your tree. You were here for it, Mario. I know, but I, I just started. I missed it. was it. great. It was really good fun. It. It, Come on. It was good fun. That was so cool. You got it. You did. So just remember as you, as you go out and as we do um, some making for the season, God, that even if, look, even if you don't make a lot, I know I try to look off camera, um, even if you don't make a lot of things, make something. Even if you don't exactly. make for Easter, make spring. If you don't make for either, make for just for yourself, make. just for making for uh, the happiness of it all. And remember that there's inspiration there. There's inspiration on the blog. There's inspiration on uh, Instagram. There's inspiration on Facebook. Um, most of the inspiration, though, is going to be on YouTube, especially now uh, on the channel, because I do think that you know, the channel makes more sense really, to you have me. done a lot of work it, there. It makes more sense. I, I couldn't even find stuff. And I'm like, how? And of course, if I would have looked in the distress category, Zoe, I would have found that video. But I didn't because I was too panicky. And instead of like clicking distress, everything about distress is in that, uh, that part on the channel. So it's really good. So I hope you guys have fun. There's a lot of great stuff to do. I'll be sharing uh, photos of a lot of this stuff uh, throughout the uh, the, the coming week, I'm sure. I don't have a blog post ready for today, but I'll put some of this stuff in the blog. Sure. I think it is good to have some photos and I'll probably work on that throughout the day and it'll be up by uh, probably Monday, but it's really good. So as you go out, I hope you enjoy your weekend. I hope you're as happy as, <laughs> as this guy makes you. Uh, eat the candy, 
eat the food, shave just, the bunnies, just be happy, shave the bunnies, like ink the stamps, just do stuff just for your own creative well-being. Even if you feel overwhelmed and you can't actually complete anything, that's okay too. Even if you sit down and yeah. and stamp a bunch of carrots and these never turn into anything but this little piece of paper, that's okay. Because when you need a quick tag or you want to tie something on or you staple it to a candy bag for your FedEx guy or something, you're good to go. And that, that would be absolutely perfect. Remember, look at what you already have. Look at your dies. Really it doesn't funny. have to be this something so new. Funny, um, it could be really just something super uh, simple that you can take and create. So, um, and when you're out there on social media, remember, if you don't have anything nice to say, find, find something, something nice, nice to, to say. say. Find it. You can do it. I know you can. That's a good challenge that even if you don't like something, if it made you stop, don't stop and go, I don't get this, too messy, too cluttered, why did you use this, uh, I don't do have this, this. Uh, I can't get this stamp, where I, whatever that is, stop and say, wow, that's really cool, great job, that's fun, uh, I need to try it with what I have, or whatever, because I think that that will always make uh, not only the creative industry, but the world a better place. So, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Tim Talks are much and better with bunny Thanks ears. for it, enjoy. <laughs> try along. Look go. at that. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys. Happy Saturday.